My friends, as we gather this morning, I want to lift up a couple announcements. First of all, I know that at times questions come up. We've installed kind of this greeting time um, into the service, and I know it doesn't always make everyone comfortable, but I want to explain why I did this so you understand. First and foremost, in the earliest church's worship service, fellowship was a very important part of that service. And so for those who come in late or leave early, and generally they're newcomers, we want them to know that they are recognized and that uh, we see them, even if they're uncomfortable. Uh, the number one complaint that I hear from people who visited churches and didn't stay or come back is because it just wasn't that welcoming. So we do this primarily for those people, but we also do it because it reminds us that we are in the body of Christ. We are in the fellowship of that. And the worship service didn't have a place for which we can just share the love of Christ with some friends and neighbors around us. So we want to do this safely, of course, um, and uh, do it so that we all feel comfortable, that we're not passing germs. And I'll tell you, I watch the evening news every night. That map of the U.S. up, I'm watching to see that one state, right? And uh, I am also considering, even though this is in your announcements, changing how we do communion uh, to just try and be more sanitary, but get offered every week. Uh, I think I'm taking, going to take attention away from the service for a while, uh, just so that we feel better, um, for two reasons. Uh, there are ways in which it can be done sanitarily, but if you're sitting in the pew and you don't take, take communion because of the way in which it's presented, then I have failed. Because I want, if you want to, I want to make that available to you in whatever way we have to present it so that you feel comfortable with that. So, um, so just when you get together, whether you're comfortable or not comfortable with greeting time, it's really just our time to be in fellowship, uh, which is uh, right in the roots of the foundation of who we are. Friends, in the way of announcements this morning, I want to point your attention right to the special announcement section in the middle of your announcements there. A healing service is, is being planned by the Stephen Ministry group in March, and we hope that you will see that. Um, Noelle is leaving uh, her post, but not leaving the church. And so we want to celebrate the gift of her ministry, and uh, there was information on that. Uh, we get first rights at registration on preschool, and that registration window was opened up for the 2021 calendar year. Um, we're um, still uh, opening up opportunities during the Lent season for uh, you to experience not only fellowship in formal services, but also remind you that Trinity and about this Lent lunches have already started. Uh, and it's a great opportunity to get a good hot meal and uh, to fellowship with the United Methodists. And so um, there's more in your bulletin this morning, but I hope that you will pray for, lift up, consider how you might be involved in the mission and ministry of the church of making disciples of Jesus Christ. Let us prepare our hearts this morning as we worship Jesus today. Thank <laughs> you. 
lifted to you in prayer requests today, Lord, and we trust fully in your care and in your answer in each situation. Even if it doesn't match the desires of our heart. For you know what is best. You have our future. For that we praise your name. We praise the name of the one who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, do you believe that Christ created you to have life and to have it to the full? So much so that he died on the cross. And so we come to the table each week remembering that sacrifice, as brutal and cruel as it was, but also remembering why he did it. Because he believes in us. Because life without us is not God's desire. And so we as Israel have a time to remember, but also a time to celebrate the gift of his life and his spirit in us and through us through the sacrament of holy that night, so long ago, as he sat in the upper room with his friends, Jesus took the bread from the table, he broke it, after blessing it, he gave it to his friends and said, this is my body broken for you, as often as you gather together, eat and remember me. When the meal was over, he took the cup, again he blessed it, gave it to his friends and said, this cup is my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let it form between you and I a new covenant of peace, of grace, of hope. As often as you gather together, we drink and And so we pray. Gracious and holy God, just as the Spirit flowed on Pentecost, we pray that you might bring your Spirit upon each one of us gathered here and upon these gifts. Bread, that through your sacrifice we might be redeemed redeemed into a life that is fully in faith, in love, and hope. Until that day in which you call us home, may all glory and honors be yours, Almighty Father, and to your Son, and to your Spirit, and all God's children said, Amen. amen. You know, by saying amen, you say, it is so. It's your affirmation of the prayer that we've just made. Friends, of our people is open to each and every person. If you're just starting your journey with Christ or if you're continuing on with it, Christ wants to be present. And so we pray that as you come, this might be a sacred moment, a moment in which God comes present and near through the gifts of bread and cup. If you would be more convenient, our ushers have communion that they can bring to you and refuse. Um, but let us come. Of course, we have anointing um, here, down here for anyone that would like to be anointed. Friends, this is Christ's meal. It's his gift for each one of us. Let's partake and open the gift and use it for his glory.
Friends, we invite our children off to uh, Children's Church this morning. Our scripture today is from John 15, verses 1 through 8. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vineyard keeper. He removes any of my branches that don't produce fruit, and he trims any branch that produces fruit so that it will produce even more fruit. You are already trimmed because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. A branch can't produce fruit by itself, but must remain in the vine. Likewise, you can't produce fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, then you will produce much fruit. Without me, you can't do anything. If you don't remain in me, you will be like a branch that is thrown out and dries up. Those branches are gathered up, thrown into a fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask for whatever you want and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified when you produce much fruit and in this way prove that you are my disciples. From 2 Corinthians 5, 17. So then, if anyone is in Christ, that person is part of the new creation. The old things have gone away and look, New things have arrived. Let's pray this morning, shall we? Gracious and holy God, we give this time our care into your care. Instruct our hearts and minds in the ways in which we might be and live more faithfully to the relationship that you're calling us into. Grant us the peace of this day and the knowledge of knowing that you are with us forever. Bless the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts. Might it be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Friends, last week, Pastor Kathleen introduced you to our sermon series, A Perfect Love, kind of a contemporary interpretation of John Wesley's sermon um, or message on the way of Christian living. He believed that we could find perfection, and as she asked you to come alongside of those who are again believing that we are moving on to a state of perfection, today we're going to talk a little bit about an obstacle that stands in our way of loving completely and perfectly as Christ desires us to do. And that is kind of this fact that at times we feel powerless. I, as I looked at um, some information this week from the Religious News Service published in 98, I found this article, ever heard of the bowling alone syndrome or refrigerator rights? If not, that makes you an average out of touch with pop culture American. Society is changing and every ministry and minister needs to adapt or die. Here are three new social labels uh, that Jeff um, Woods, author of Congregational Megatrends, says that are impacting the church in our day. The first is the bowling alone syndrome. I've read a lot about this. It describes the breakup of our civil society and the retreat from participation in all sorts of voluntary organizations. The American Bowling Congress reports that more people are bowling than ever before, but they're bowling alone. The number of bowling leagues is down because people will bowl when they feel like it, when the mood strikes, not when they're scheduled to be there. It's a lone ranger mentality overriding a team mentality. Where are you when the mood strikes you in your market? Woods goes on to explain another phenomenon. Refrigerator writes, as how many people do you know who feel so comfortable and welcome with you to come into your home, to go into the refrigerator, 
take anything they want and get a glass of cold water without asking or saying anything. Probably not many in our world. Larry has a couple. Can you think of many who would just walk in your house but who aren't related to you? Helping people today feel more comfortable is critical. The third trend that you wanted to point to is road rage and reveals a sense of powerlessness that many of us feel. We feel that nothing that we touch responds to our control. Not our spouses, not our children, not our careers. The only thing that does respond is an automobile. So when we get behind the wheel, all our frustrations boil up and road rage is the result. Think about that for a minute, about how isolated we've become as a community. Some because we've learned to distrust institutions and organizations, governments, companies, and even the church. At times we turn around and wonder how and who we can trust and entrust with our lives. Well, when we read the scriptures today that we were created by God I wonder, what were we created for? Well, the Gospels tell us quite clearly, we were created first for flourishing, that we would live lives of peace and of plenty. Second, we were created for developing our powers, our powers intellectually, our powers physically, and our powers emotionally, and become the whole person that God created us to be, the old is gone and the new has come. So living in the perfect power of God's perfect love that enables us to do and to become all that God created us to be. John uses a very interesting metaphor today in the vine. You see, if you talk to um, orchard farmers, I guess it's what they were orchard growers, then you'll know that at times the vine itself will focus on growing in length and in leaves and never bear fruit. So what does a farmer do in this situation? Chop it off and start anew, plant new seeds? What they do at times is they take an axe and they mar or cut into the bottom of the stalk of the grape. God uses negative experiences in our life to kind of boost us, to lift us up. Because it's in the negative experiences in life, it's in the moments in which we are filled with doubt and wondering that we seek and move beyond this life into the questions of why. It's the reason why my funeral message is most commonly, where are you at today? Because in those moments in which we recognize our immortality and the times in the, that we can live a life through our choices that is God desiring and God fearing, it's in those moments just after we've lost the job or had the diagnosis where things don't go as we'd hoped or wished and prayers and answered in the way in which we wanted. It's in the troubles of life that we turn back to the divine. You remember the church, the Sunday following 9-11. It's in those moments that we as a community turn back and say, God, what's going on here? And the struggles, I think, are the challenges for us to remain faithful and trusting is not in the bad times, but in the good times. When everything seems to be going great and we don't have a need or may not always see the constant desire and need to stay in connection. The fruit God wants us to bear is spiritual fruit. He wants us to foster and grow the fruit of the Spirit within us. So, God uses the trials in our life as an axe, or the suffering in our lives as a pruning knife. So we will stop challenging, channeling our energies in the pursuit of temporal things and allow sorrow, tribulation, ill health, and disappointment to have a way of stimulating us back into the proper relationship with God. Our attention is redirected toward eternal things, and we produce the fruits of righteousness that glorify God in His name. 
not everything that we find that hurts us is wrong. Now, I have to confess a little bit about my sons here without them knowing, which is always dangerous. Mom's laughing, wondering, or is this from going to rain? But the things, one of the things they hated the most is getting shots at the doctor. Did you ever think about it from the one-year-old or two-year-old's perspective? This loving parent takes their child into this place, everything's great, right? Doctor wants to look at their belly, that's awesome, okay, this is my belly, right? Might even go back to their arm and they put this cold little thing, oh, that kind of tickles. And then the horror begins. Mom and dad stand back, smiling, saying to their child, it's going to be okay when they let a stranger poke them. Sorry, Jake, if this is new to you, buddy. <laughs> I forgot you were sitting there. <laughs> like, what? But we know that at times that hurt and pain, right, as adults, is done for our protection, our immunization, right? That we might grow stronger through the pain, right? That we might build up antibodies through the pain, that we can fight off the diseases in life. So not every trial or tribulation is not God, I wouldn't say ordained, but you know, God doesn't step in in those situations. Because I find in those situations, people draw even closer to the divine. And it's for, in many cases, our own health. Even though our understanding of that situation as a one-year-old or a two-year-old is limited, there's a greater plan, a greater purpose, and a greater point to our life. Israel has its history of going through its time of pain. The vineyard reference brings us back to Psalm 80. In verses 8 through 18, we find these, this picture of Israel. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. Then it planted its roots deep, filling the land. The mountains were covered by its shades. The mighty cedars were covered by its branches. It set its branches all the way to the sea. Its shoots went all the way to the Euphrates River. So why have you now torn down its walls? So that all who come along can pluck its fruit. So that any boar from the forest can tear it up. So that the bugs can feed on it. Please come back, God of heavenly forces. Look down from heaven and perceive it. Attend to its wine. This root you have planted with your strong hand. This sun you have secured as your very own. It is burned with fire. It is chopped down. They die at the rebuke coming from you. This would have been a song, as a song, that the Jewish people and the Israelites in the neighborhood, as Jesus was speaking about the true vine, would have associated with growth, prosperity, and fruit, often symbols of God's people and God's kingdom in the world. Jesus turns to the text and says, I am the true vine. This can only mean for us that Israel has gone astray, a bit wild, as Psalm 80 alludes to in many of the prophets. That Israel has strayed away and Jesus has come to reorient and move them back. Jesus is the one who knows God's purposes and are now resting upon his shoulders. And his followers are members of God's true people if they belong to him. This picture of the vine is a clever illustration for, isn't just a clever illustration for garden. It is the basic imagery that Jesus uses in this passage to emphasize the communal aspect and the relationship, relational nature of a life lived in and through faith. This parable of the vine challenges all of us to live lives that have been constructed largely on the modern idea of sovereign individuality. From this standpoint, acts in the community tend to be seen as outside of the central space and purpose of our life. The church thus appears to be something that we are part of, 
a part of our major spheres in our lives, such as work and life and home. But Jesus' parable, however, through its imagery, suggests that living a life of growing communally of faith is the central purpose and central sphere that we should live all aspects of our life within. This part involves the production of fruits, of goods, which accrue not just for the private good of the individual, but for the good of the whole. And to extend this logic and assembly, these fruits accrue to the farmer or to the Lord, its true owner. With this view in mind, God planted and tends the vines. And this passage is ultimately about God's divine providence and the goodness of creation when it acknowledges its creator as the sole source that we should depend upon. Think of John's community for a minute. This new wave of Judaism, for the disciples didn't leave thinking that they were going to start a new religious institution called Christianity all alone. They thought what they were ushering in was a message brought by Jesus. The old is gone, the new has come. It might be a reflection of this movement into what the Messiah has taught them. But a lot of what they teach could be antithetical to the basic teachings, leading them to be in a very precarious situation. We know from the early parts of the book of Acts that Paul himself represents a group of people in Judaism that is hunting down and trying to eliminate the Christians. But God had a purpose. And the historian Josephus even speaks of the fact that, in his words, it seems like for every Christian we bring to the Colosseum floor, a hundred or a thousand new ones are created. People, it's not outside of our human nature to want the good life. But Christianity calls us into a life that is good. And at times embraces the trials and the tribulations as times for us to draw back into or to be reminded to trust in the Father. And to the God that loves us, that created us, and that cares for us. Within John's context, being a community that's Suspect in the eyes of the established religious authority and subject to excommunication, community for them has become everything. You see, to head in this new direction meant that you were most commonly cast out of your home. You were landless, familyless, either temporarily or permanently, to suffer the ultimate shame and fate. The disciples in John's community are struggling to redefine what it means to live within the relationship while struggling within their own familial relationships as the family hasn't come to the new way. In the context of John's reality, we can find a comforting picture that the God who brought them to life is still in control as the vine grower. The vine and the fruit are the gifts from God. As in the Old Testament, Israel saw itself as the vine planted and created by God. However, Israel has disappointed God. And in John's minds, these branches did not produce fruit. It's a calling together, not just individually, of turning back to God, but of a community turning back to God. Such as the African proverb, Ubuntu, which means, I am because we are. Jesus is our Savior. The common everyday image of the vine transforms us into a symbol of community, of mission, of love. The community is characterized by interdependence, mutual respect, and outgoing presence of Christ into the world. We must remain in the community, for there is no such thing as solo Christianity. We can't go it alone. John Wesley believed this. He was, as the theme has been this week, created for the glory of God. Wesley believed and suggested that the full development of the powers of God lead to glorifying God. His view is quite contrary to this 
uh, Wesley's view is quite contrary to the reasoning that God creates humans for the sake of flourishing and full development and for the developmental needs of themselves and not for God's glory. And he says we have three capabilities. Our mind, God the Creator is not glorified through our denigration, but through the wonder of who we were created to be. Of our heart. And he said this week, the richer our emotional capacities are, the greater our capacities to give and to receive God's love from God and for others. And our physical powers. Having been endowed with the bodies of Christ, we are developed in our bodies to the fullness of our power to glorify God. In the end, glorifying God is what this is about. Nothing other than that is an act of love for God. God is a pure fountain of love, not abstractly, not philosophically, not in isolated splendor. Rather, God's very nature is to love, and through loving, to elicit our own love in return. Tony Campolo tells this story of transformation. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians, So eat then, if anyone is in Christ, that person is part of a new creation. The old things have gone away, and the new things have come. In his book, Letters to a Young Evangelical, he shares this story as a youth taking communion. He says, sitting with my parents at a communion service when I was very young, perhaps six or seven, year old, seven years old, I became aware of a young woman in the pew in front of me who was sobbing and shaking. The pastor had just finished reading the passage of scripture where Paul says, Whoever shall eat and drink of the cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the blood and body of our Lord. As the communion plate with its small pieces of bread were passed to the crying woman before me, she waved them away and lowered her head in despair. It was then that my Sicilian father leaned over her shoulder and in his best broken English said sternly, Take it, girl. It is meant for you. Do you hear? She raised her head and nodded, and she took the bread and ate it. And I knew in that moment that some kind of heavy burden had been lifted from her head and from her heart. Since then, I have always known that a church that could offer communion to hurting people was a special gift from God. Is this the church we are to become for all of God's creation? So then, if anyone is in Christ, that person is part of a new creation. The old things have gone away, and look, new things have arrived. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done. My Father is glorified when you produce much fruit, and in this way prove that you are my disciples. The challenge for us is to seek on our own to love perfectly. But through the power of all that God can and is doing, by turning our attention, our heart, our minds, our souls back to Him, that we find a heart that aches for those who are not in our community yet. That the battle is not amongst us. The battle is a spiritual one. And one that Jesus has already won on the cross. Let us pray as the praise man comes this morning. And we prepare our hearts to sing his glory. Gracious and almighty God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for being a God who lives. That we might live within the relationship of peace of hope and of love. Grant us the gift of your glory, your presence, the newness of life, that we as confident children might grow once again to bear fruit that pleases you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
with Jimmy Schmuck. Now, wherever we be, we're with them. The Hat Academy has to be in the system. As you can see, there's many different reasons why to have a CU minister. Right now, currently, we have 17 active Stephen ministers. When you're matched with a Stephen minister, you meet once a week, about an hour, and you just tell him or her what's on your mind. So I'd like to remind you that Stephen ministry is for everyone. We all go through trials. And um, to contact one, just contact me, or you can call the office. And don't forget about the um, healing service next week at 3.30, and that'll be in the chapel. And I'd love to see everyone. Thank you. Friends, I know that there are some amongst us today, maybe we do or don't know Vicki, but we probably know someone else in this congregation. If you have been a Stephen minister or are a Stephen minister, could you stand in case there are those who have questions um, down the road and might want to see what Stephen ministry offers to them. We thank you for your service and your sharing. This ministry and others are made possible because of your gifts of care and of love for your church and for the world. And so I invite our ushers to come forward this morning to collect our morning offering.
Let us go forth this week in faith and belief and love and in trust to the one who loves us more than we could possibly know. By his power, by his beauty, by his gift, might we be filled to overflowing with the power that is transformative in the world. Go in the grace and peace of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.